This podcast is a local production of Mississippi Public Broadcasting and depends on the support of listeners like you. If you can, please donate today at mpbonline.org. And thanks. Good morning. Thanks for joining us today on Southern Remedy Healthy and Fit. I'm your host, Dr. Josie Bidwell, Associate Professor of Preventive Medicine and Nurse Practitioner at the University of Mississippi Medical Center. Today, we're going to be talking about healthy holidays and how we can stay healthy and fit as we enter this holiday season. If you have a question or a comment for us, our number is one eight seven seven mpb ring It's one 672 7464 You can always send us an email, fit at mpbonline.org, or you can go over to Facebook and uh, follow me there and do Healthy Habits with Josie, and you can submit questions there any time of the week uh, that we answer on the show. So um, I want to take a minute and say that it is National Nurse Practitioner Week. So happy NP Week to all my fellow nurse practitioners out there who are um, are working to keep everybody healthy and safe, um, not just during the holidays, but all year long. Um, you know, congrats for being part of the the best job I think in the world, and and happy happy NP Week to all of those folks there. So, um, you know, I don't think that it can be November without talking about uh, holiday celebrations and holiday gatherings and how we stay uh, stay healthy during that time. And, you know, I do shows like this most every year, but it looks a little bit different this year because we have an extra layer of things to talk about. Um, you know, we're going to talk, spend a little bit of time talking about um, food and, and how that plays into staying healthy uh, during the holiday season, because that's still an important part. Um, but we're also going to talk about, you know, how we stay as um, as healthy as we can in light of coronavirus and the impact that that's going to have on holiday gatherings. And then we've still got the flu. It has not, it's not going anywhere. It, it's still flu season that we're entering there. And so there are, are lots of different areas that we need to, to think about as we move into, um, into this holiday season with, with Thanksgiving and then with, um, with Christmas or what, um, whatever uh, holiday you celebrate during, uh, during this time. Uh, I, will, I will say that they, uh, Halloween looked a little bit different this year, and uh, we had a blast uh, for Halloween this year. And uh, we chose not to, to trick or treat uh, with our kids this year, just, you know, looking on kind of our personal goals and what we felt was best for our family. But what we did was develop uh, or build a candy shoot. And so we had a huge piece of PVC pipe that we ran from our front door down to our steps and everything was decorated for Day of the Dead. We all, uh, my husband, myself, and our boys were decorated. Uh, we weren't decorated. Well, I guess we kind of were. But we were dressed up uh, Day of the Dead style. And we were able to shoot candy down this uh, contraption for the trick-or-treaters that came to our house. And while it was certainly different than what we have done in the past, we actually had a really good time doing that. Our house was the hit uh, um hit of the neighborhood folks uh, came by to take videos with uh with the shoot and pictures with the decorations and that kind of stuff so um even if our celebrations look different it's still an opportunity to enjoy each other enjoy your family and make new memories uh my boys will remember the year of the candy shoot uh, much more than they'll remember you know, just the, the regular trick-or-treating that we've we've done in the past. So um, different doesn't necessarily mean worse. It's just different. And so we've, we've got to talk about that and what the risks are and what we call a risk-benefit evaluation of how we celebrate um, 
Thanksgiving, since it's kind of the first the first holiday that we have coming up. And just like when uh, things started to reopen, there were lists that got pushed out on the risks associated with different activities and things that were considered low risk, things that were considered mo- considered moderate risk, and things that were considered more high risk activities. And that has been released for for the holiday as well. And so that can be found on the CDC website, but there are activities that are listed as low risk, moderate risk, and high risk in terms of um, gatherings and celebrations for the holiday season. And so I'm going to kind of run through uh, some of those, and then we can talk about how, um, how we choose the right fit for, for our family, right? And so the, the lowest risk activities that can happen is just having a small dinner Um, or lunch with just your household, right? Which is pretty similar to what you're probably doing on a day-to-day basis, but the maybe a little bit more festive, right? So a small dinner with just your household. Um, Or, and I really like this idea, and it's probably something that we're going to do this year, preparing kind of family recipes, things that have been handed down um, through your family and delivering it to friends or neighbors or family in the area. We may even kind of set up uh, our iPads and kind of virtually cook together for some some different things there and then deliver those uh, out. That way we still get the family bonding as well as the comforting flavors that we're used to while limiting our uh, risk. Um, virtual dinners are, are, are another option. Of course, that's dependent upon how strong your internet signal is. And then while not expressly part of the Thanksgiving dinner, um, something that is pretty common for folks to do, which is Black Friday shopping, right? And that is really something we need to look at and, and think about how we're going to approach that going forward. Um, you know, that it would be a much more high risk event. And so maybe everybody's in their PJs with some hot cocoa and we're doing virtual shopping or shopping online um, on Black Friday and limiting our exposure to people um, and kind of watching parades and events from home. So what I don't want people to, to think I'm saying is that you should be overly fearful, that you should lock yourself in your home, that you should not be living your life. That is absolutely not um, what I'm saying. I'm saying we need to acknowledge the risks that are associated with each activity and put plans in place to limit them where we can um, and really judge them against what uh, what the risk would be to your individual self or to your family um, or your household, right? So as we kind of leave the, the lower risk and move into more of a moderate risk category, um, that's where we may start to have uh, dinner with people outside of our household, so family and friends, and outdoor, right? So that is a more moderate risk activity, Um, maybe visiting pumpkin patches or um, we don't really have the orchards so much here in in Mississippi, but outdoor events while still wearing your masks and social distancing and all of those types of things. And then the higher risk activities are going to be where we don't really make adjustments to uh, our usual, right? We are still going uh, Black Friday shopping, We're doing crowded parties and events, large indoor gatherings, and then uh, one that usually never mixes well at holidays, which is alcohol, um, for a variety of reasons. But when we consume alcohol at at events, a variety of things happens. One, just from a purely calorie standpoint, we usually eat or drink um, uh, more when we also consume alcohol because it lowers our inhibitions and we we don't make as good of decisions about our food and beverage choices. Um, The other is where we um, don't make good decisions about social distancing and hand washing and those types of things. So um, really alcohol 
if done at all, should be very, very limited during during the holidays, just because we do tend to not make as great of decisions. Um, and we tend to say things that maybe we wouldn't say if we weren't consuming alcohol, and none of those tend to mix well um, during the holiday season. So if you're interested in kind of seeing what um, – what those risk categories are, I'm happy to push that out on social media so that you'll have that there. I'm Dr. Josie Bidwell, Associate Professor of Preventive Medicine and Nurse Practitioner at the University of Mississippi Medical Center. Thanks for listening to the Southern Remedy Healthy and Fit Podcast. If you have a question, you can email fit at mpbonline.org or leave a comment on my Facebook page, Healthy Habits with Josie. For ongoing information on staying healthy and fit, subscribe to the podcast using your favorite podcasting app. No matter if you use an app to start your car or still have a flip phone, Everyday Tech can decipher today's technology for tomorrow's solutions. Subscribe now to the podcast using any podcast app or the MPB public media app. This is an MPB Think Radio podcast. listening to Southern Remedy Healthy and Fit on MPB Think Radio. I'm Dr. Josie Bidwell, nurse practitioner at UMMC, and we're talking about a healthy and fit Thanksgiving this year. And I've posed the question of what food just has to be on your holiday table, or it's just, it's not Thanksgiving if you don't have that food. So Kevin, what, what is your, like, you have to have it or... Thanksgiving's canceled kind of food. Do I have to limit it to just one? <laughs> <laughs> I'll give you I'll give you two. Um hmm. I am going to go with two things that my sister in law makes uh when I go to my brother's house in Hattiesburg to eat, which I usually do. Uh one is it's kind of a homemade macaroni and cheese that she makes with a number of different cheeses. Uh and then the other is um it's a like a squash casserole that she makes with the, using the yellow squash. So those are two of my favorites. But uh, she's such such an excellent cook uh, that I always look forward to going down there on on holiday time. Well, I think you probably just earned brownie points with with her for talking about how good of a cook she is. So uh, yay! Um, so macaroni and cheese is is one of my things as well, which you guys know I'm. Um, plant-based and so cheese is not a plant um unfortunately i wish there was a cheese plant because (laughs) cheese is delicious um and so macaroni and cheese is one of those things that uh historically has been on our table last year my boys were actually um sick with you know regular regular crud last year for um for thanksgiving so we didn't get to go uh, to my parents. And so I made uh, vegan mac and cheese, which is good, but, it, but it, it's not mac and cheese. Like it, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't taste like mom's mac and cheese. And I think, uh, you know, if you're, if you're going to be experimenting with plant-based recipes this holiday season, which I, I hope that you do things like mac and cheese, go into it, expecting it not to taste like mac and cheese. Like it can be delicious, but it's never, or I have not found a recipe that makes it taste exactly like like mac and cheese, um, it, but it's still good. But, you know, if we were able to visit with my parents and my mom made mac and cheese, I would just give myself a little bit of grace and I would probably eat a little bit of mac and cheese and, and just kind of move on uh, from there, knowing that that's not part of my regular, uh, you know, daily habit and those kinds of things. But for me, um, the thing that has to be on my Thanksgiving table or Christmas too is sweet potatoes. I, I adore sweet potatoes. Um, and not just your run of the mill baked sweet potato or sweet potato fries that we have during the year. But, um, so if you, well, if you ask my husband, it has to be sweet potato casserole with the marshmallows on top. Uh, <laughs> and that's good. Uh, and that's what he, you know, he had growing up. And so that's kind of his memories. Uh, for me, it's candied sweet potatoes. That's what my grandma always, um, fixed was, was, were candied sweet potatoes. And so that's what I'm always kind of looking for on, on my holiday table. I do use less sugar than, than she used. Um, and I don't put any butter in mine. She also threw a little bit of butter in hers. And so I cut those out. Um, knowing that it's still not a, like a 
health dish, but I'm just kind of lightening it up a little bit there. Um, we've had some come in on Facebook this morning um, with what, you know, kind of what your favorite holiday dish is. And somebody posted a, a green bean casserole. And so I'm going to take a look at that recipe um, later. Um, I will take this time to talk about casseroles, right? Because you mentioned a squash casserole. Um, and casseroles are, you know, a big part uh, of what of what we put on our holiday tables. And that's fine. Um, we do, or you don't have to, but I usually look for ways to, to tweak them a little bit if we're trying to watch our calories at all. Now, you know, kind of the, the people on the opposite side of the fence for me will say it's just one time a year, so eat whatever you want to, right? And I don't live with you, and I'm not going to police you. Um, but if you're trying to maintain weight during the holiday season, which is a goal for a lot of people, kind of that maintain, don't gain mentality, um, then there are ways we can tweak recipes that still give us the flavors that we want, the things that we enjoy, um, while cutting out extra things that we may not need. And so casseroles are often a big, big calorie bomb because they have, um, they usually start with butter or, um, milk, cream, cheese, uh, different condensed soups, you know, cream of mushroom soup, cream of chicken soup, those kinds of things. And those uh, are usually packed full of um, fat and, and salt, really sodium. So it's, it's not saying we can't use them and can't do our recipes the way we've always done them, but just thinking about ways to maybe cut back on things. So, you know, if you are going to be sauteing veggies kind of as the base of your casserole, right? If you're going to be sauteing up some onions and garlic and celery and carrots and those kinds of things, think about how much oil you really need to do that, right? Can you, instead of just liberally pouring oil or butter into your pan, can you switch to a spray um, to saute those veggies in? Uh, and then if they start to stick, just add a little splash of water, a little splash of wine, a little splash of stock to that area to keep it from sticking. Um, and you're still going to have the same flavor, but you've cut a ton of fat out um, of that recipe or a ton of calories out. Because remember that every tablespoon of fat, regardless of whether it's butter or canola oil or olive oil or any of those kinds of things is 120 calories and 14 grams of fat. And so it adds up very, very quickly when every recipe starts with a pat or two of butter or a, a wallop of, um, of olive oil or canola oil, or those kinds of things. So just thinking about ways that we can, can pull back on that. And then if we're using, um, you know, cheeses, how much cheese do we actually need in that particular recipe? And usually my uh, recommendation for cheeses when we're adding them to things is pick bolder flavored cheese. The bolder the flavor, the less cheese you need for it to taste like cheese, right? When we use things like um, American cheese or even mozzarella, something like that. Those are very mild flavored cheeses. And so we have to add a whole bunch of it to make it taste cheesy, to really get that, that kind of salty pop that we're looking for in a cheese. And so maybe changing to a sharp cheddar, um, or at least a, a medium cheddar, is going to let you add cheese, get the cheese flavor for not as much, right? If you're doing salads and you're crumbling things in them, again, think about big, bold flavored cheeses like um, feta is a good one, as well as a blue cheese. I am not a, a blue cheese lover, but there, uh, there are, it's a very polarized cheese, I feel. People either really, really like that cheese or they really, really don't like that cheese. And so um, if you're in the camp of really, really uh, loving that, then, you know, crumbling some of that into a salad um, could be a good way to do that. Um, a couple years back in our um, teaching kitchen, we debuted a Brussels sprout salad that we did for, for, um, for Thanksgiving and Christmas. And it was shaved Brussels sprouts. So not a cooked Brussels sprout, which is, you know, most of us have a very, uh, sad childhood memory of, of boiled Brussels sprouts and just these sad little tiny cabbage looking things sitting on our plate staring at us. 
Um, but so this is an uncooked Brussels sprout, so a completely different flavor profile. So shaved there, some roasted um, butternut squash or roasted sweet potatoes in there, some dried cranberries, some pecans, um, and then a crumbling of feta into that salad. And a lot of people were like, wait, what? Feta in this? And it, it's got such a nice, bold flavor to it that you need less dressing or all those other kinds of things on the salad because it packs such a good flavor uh, kind of wallop going on there. So think about ways to add those different things in into your holiday. Now, something that I'm not going to mess with is mama's dressing, right? So mama's dressing is mama's dressing. And however mama makes it, mama makes it and, my, and I'm going to eat it because it's it's delicious and that that's her thing there. Um, and it is dressing in my family. It's not stuffing. Uh, we call it dressing. And again, there's kind of two camps of people, whether it's stuffing or dressing. But regardless of whether you call it stuffing or dressing, be very careful if you actually stuff it into the bird. That's usually um, very hard to get it cooked all the way um, and not have kind of undercooked turkey juices in it, right, which can can lead to foodborne illness there. So just be careful with that if, if you're a, a stuffing in the bird kind of kind of family um, and be careful with that. It's, it's if you want to put some in there and cook it that way, I usually recommend folks also fix a pan of stuffing um, or dressing to have on the side and that's what you actually eat from. Um, it's just a little bit safer in terms of uh, um, foodborne illness because nobody wants to spend uh, their Thanksgiving afternoon in the emergency room getting IV fluids and nausea medications. That does not say happy holidays to me. I'm Dr. Josie Bidwell, Associate Professor of Preventive Medicine and Nurse Practitioner at the University of Mississippi Medical Center. Thanks for listening to the Southern Remedy Healthy and Fit Podcast. If you have a question, you can email fit at mpbonline.org or leave a comment on my Facebook page, Healthy Habits with Josie. For ongoing information on staying healthy and fit, subscribe to the podcast using your favorite podcasting app. Hi, I'm Walt Grayson. You can now listen to the wild, weird, and wonderful stories of Mississippi with Mile Marker. Some of the big names that travel up and down the highways, obviously Elvis and Johnny Cash, and you have Jerry Lee Lewis, Carl Perkins. Join me as we hit the roads of Mississippi on Mile Marker. Johnny Cash suggested that Carl write a song called Blue Suede Shoes. That was all kind of created with Aaron Amory. You can listen by going to mpbonline.org slash radio or by using your favorite podcasting app. This is an MPB Think Radio podcast. You're listening to Southern Remedy Healthy and Fit on MPB Think Radio. And I'm your host, Dr. Josie Bidwell, Associate Professor of Preventive Medicine and Nurse Practitioner at UMMC. And reminding everybody, it is Nurse Practitioner Week. So if you know a nurse practitioner, love a nurse practitioner, or kind of even tolerate a nurse practitioner, tell them thank you for all the things that they do to keep you healthy and fit. We've been talking about healthy holidays today. And if you have a question or a comment, in particular, if you want to share your favorite Thanksgiving food or side dish, I'd love to hear that. Our number is a one eight seven seven. MPB ring. It's one 672 7464 You can also drop it over on my Facebook page, Healthy Habits with Josie. And uh, my personal Facebook page is blowing up with uh, my request for what are your favorite uh, Thanksgiving uh, meal items. And so I'm going to run through some of those. Uh, sweet potatoes feature prominently. And as I was s- scrolling through, I saw somebody say candied sweet potatoes. And I was like, oh, it's my spirit animal. And I looked and it was my aunt. So, uh, that <laughs> so yeah, yeah, we are, uh, we are thinking of the same candied sweet potatoes. Cause I know who she's thinking of. She's thinking of my grandmother who's no longer with us. And, uh, so we try and make them, they're never as good as what she made. So if you've still got your grandmama hanging around, appreciate those bites of food, um, that, that she's fixing for you. Uh, and, re- and remember those memories around them because I can still remember what uh, the last time I ate hers and what they tasted like. And that's that's what food is about is making memories. Um, some other things that came in cornbread dressing featured um, heavily as well. 
uh, somebody mentioned that they learned, uh, actually a former, former MPBer Ezra commented that, um, he learned how to make great Mississippi cornbread dressing when he was down here. And now he's missing it, uh, back, back up North with the, the stuff and train. So I wish I could mail him some cornbread dressing, but I figured that that would probably be mm, not a good idea. It would probably not, not travel well there. Um, homemade cranberry sauce is another good one. That's a recipe that I've tried multiple times and haven't found great success with making um, uh, my own cranberry sauce. So if you've got a recipe for that, you want to shoot me. I am taking suggestions on how to to fix the cranberry sauce situation. Um, we've got shoe peg corn casserole, which I don't know what that is. I mean, I know what shoe peg corn is. I know what a casserole is, but I'm not quite sure what a shoe peg corn casserole is because I've never had that, but I am intrigued as to what that would be. Lots of uh, green bean casseroles on here. Um, boiled cabbage was one. Um, so lots of, of varieties of different things out there. I've shared my um, cabbage recipe on here before. Um, another thing that we always have uh, at either Thanksgiving or Christmas is some type of greens, whether it be um, cabbage or whether it be more like turnip greens. When I fix my greens, I do three greens together. I do turnip greens, mustard greens, nope, sorry, turnip greens, collard greens, and kale is what I do together there. And before moving to a more plant-based lifestyle, um, of course, when I was growing up, it was uh, ham hock that was in there. When I started getting, you know, working on pulling some extra fat out of my diet, we switched to smoked turkey legs or smoked turkey wings to kind of add that smoky flavor um, into there. And then once I moved into more plant-based eating uh, pattern, I moved to the use of smoked paprika, which we've talked about on the show before, but is an excellent way to get that smoky flavor without adding a meat product if you're... Um, looking at there. If you've gone in the store and looked for smoked paprika, you may get a little sticker shock when you see it. It's usually about six or seven dollars a bottle, but it is, um, you, you don't need a ton of it to get a lot of flavor. So it, it lasts a, a fairly long time there. And so when I'm doing my um, onions and garlic, then I also throw that smoked paprika in there. So it toasts a little bit with the, with the veggies and really kind of blooms and gives that nice, good smoky um, smell and flavor to all the food there. Um, so just a, you know, a different way to approach traditional Southern side dishes that we see while keeping an eye on, uh, uh, you know, on my waistline a little bit um, so that I don't uh, over consume calories. Uh, another tip that I have for that is to eat breakfast on the day of, of, of Thanksgiving. You know, we tend to get very busy, especially if we are the, the cookers um, for, for Thanksgiving. You know, we're in the kitchen and making lots of different things and we tend to, to skip breakfast. When we skip that, we tend to overconsume at the meal because we're we're hangry by that point in time, and so we eat much more than we we normally um, would. And so it doesn't mean we can't have uh, you know a mid afternoon snack of of some more of those foods going on, but preventing kind of that overeating where you just feel miserable afterwards. So you know, eat a breakfast doesn't have to be a you know a grand slam breakfast full of everything but you know even a little bowl of cereal and some fruit or um you know a little handful of granola and some yogurt something like that just to put some food in our belly so that we're not so ravenous by the time meal time rolls around now that also brings me to appetizers because um most thanksgivings start with some type of little offering set out for people to munch on while uh, while the main event is being fixed and so that's an opportunity to get in some extra fruits and veggies. And it's also an opportunity for infection prevention. So instead of, you know, setting out a bowl of chips that everybody's going to kind of put their hands in or um, dips that people may stand over and, and dip in, then we can do kind of little individual serving things. I just get like the little plastic um, 
little plastic cups that you use for the the bathroom, like to to do water in the bathroom. And I make like hummus or you, know, you can do ranch dip or something like that and put a little a little of that in the bottom and then put some cut veggies in that. And so then people can just grab one of those little cups and, and eat directly from that. So they're not double dipping in your dip. They're not putting their hands all in things and, and touching. And it's just kind of built in portion control there. All right, we do have a caller. We'll go to Mobile and talk with Mikey. Good morning, Mikey. Hey, good morning. I love this show as usual. Um, I got a citrus. Oh, thank you. A, a citrus. I, I can't. I can't say that, Sylvester. Um, <laughs> a, a citrus suggestion and okay. um, a peanut idea question. Okay. Okay. Sure. All right. Lay it um, on me. The, the citrus suggestion is an old um, tradition, also. Um, maybe a little more here in Mobile, where we grow sets. I got to plug Mobile. Um, satsumas and, and uh, uh, you know, the lemons mm -hmm. and stuff like that. Uh, but anywhere, you can get – those things are readily available anywhere. Ambrosia is something that was made. Mm -hmm. And the other good thing about it is that the ambrosia maker in my family was my grandfather. Not my <gasps> grandmama. Yeah. My nanny who did all the other work in the slave, but he got the raves for the ambrosia, which is um, – uh, basically, if you if you can't find anything else, you can even use canned mandarin mm -hmm. orange and um, and grapefruit or any whatever citrus you can get your hands on, some coconut and some juice, and maybe if you if you re he put maraschino cherries in his, I would mm -hmm. go with Morellos or something like that, which you can buy easily, pretty much in a lot of or dried cherries even or other dried fruits. And it gives a really good kind of sweet – you can make it as sweet or not sweet as you mm -hmm. want. And it gives that good acid balance taste to um, – for meat eaters, they really love it because whether it's roast or burnt or whatever you're, you got, you know, it kind of cuts that fattiness to it. Mm -hmm. And for everybody else, it's – it just it just adds somehow. But I've had great success – with the people in my family who are pretty hardcore, okay? <laughs> <laughs> um, that sounds and, great. Uh, I, I vaguely remember ambrosia, but I didn't, I didn't, you know, it was weird looking when I was a kid, so I didn't try it. But I might have to, to dust that well, off this that, year. There you go, you know. I mean, we're, we're all weird kids, right? You know, oh, one yeah. time or another. Okay, now my question is peanut-based stuff. I have recently discovered, and you were part of this, peanut powder, yeah. And I love it. I can't believe how many things can be done with it, and I haven't even gotten to half of them. What's your <laughs> best suggestion? For uh, it, oh, for oh, using peanut butter? That. Peanut powder? Uh, well, no, 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 not peanut butter. Peanut powder. Right, for using the peanut powder? Yeah, oh, well, I'm wait, I, I did that first, of course. You know, it's like, um, yeah. and uh, at 50 calories as opposed to, what, 100 mm -hmm. and whatever you know, it's, yeah. uh, let's let's face it, it's it's the deal, and the less salt and sugar thing too. Mm -hmm. But um, mm -hmm. it's the deal anyway. You look at it, and I've experimented a little bit with sauces and stuff, and I think I'm thinking your idea with the uh, uh, I hadn't thought of uh, the little because I'm not going to be doing anything like that. But the little cups, right. the bathroom yeah. cups for dipping sauce, that might be good. Yeah. Make an Asian sauce or make your own yes. sauce. And that was going to gonna be my, so I use the peanut powder in two ways, usually. I'll throw it in smoothies for me because it yeah. adds that little extra bit of protein that I'm looking for sometimes, especially if I've been working out. Uh, but it yeah. doesn't add, you know, so many calories and fat that it kind of negates my workout. And then I use it for um, for sauces and dressings, in particular, more kind of Asian style um, dipping sauces if I'm doing kind of spring rolls or wraps or something like that. Um, yeah. and I'm doing like a like a Thai spicy peanut kind of sauce. Um, it makes a great uh, addition in there. So I'm glad you're using it. Oh, and of course, um, uh, soups would be great, and um, yes. even coffee. I'd put a, a little bit, and uh, not too much. You don't your coffee to be peanut butter, but it makes yeah. a great creamer. <laughs> it, I have not tried that. You know, I'm a coffee well, lover, so I may have to give that a whirl. I'm glad to swap ideas with you, and thank you so much. I feel like maybe I paid you back a little bit. Huh? 
I'm Dr. Josie Bidwell, Associate Professor of Preventive Medicine and Nurse Practitioner at the University of Mississippi Medical Center. Thanks for listening to the Southern Remedy Healthy and Fit Podcast. If you have a question, you can email fit at mpbonline.org or leave a comment on my Facebook page, Healthy Habits with Josie. For ongoing information on staying healthy and fit, subscribe to the podcast using your favorite podcasting app. If you ever miss one of our locally produced shows or want to simply hear it again, you can find what you need at mpbonline.org or download our podcast app to your smartphone. MPB programming is on your schedule at mpbonline.org.